Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. Well, thank you, Anton and worship team for leading us, helping us to worship today. I love that last song, My Ever Chasing God, perfect theme for this morning. And before I begin, I want to welcome those of you watching online today. So glad you can join us from wherever you are. I want to begin um, with a little story I heard some time ago. One Sunday morning, a pastor is walking through the children's ministry area of his church uh, when he saw a little girl come out of Sunday school. And he recognized her because he knew her family uh, from church. And so he said, hi there, Susie. You have fun in Sunday school today? And she went, mm-hmm. Pastor says, what did you learn today? And little Susie said, we learned about Jonah. He got swallowed up by a fish. And then the pastor decided to have a little bit of fun. So he said, did you say Jonah got swallowed by a fish? Susie says, mm-hmm. God sent a big fish and swallowed him whole and then spit him out again. The pastor said, whoa, how do you know that really happened? And Susie said, because the Bible says so. And then he said, how do you know the Bible is true? And she said, because my teacher says so. And then he said, how do you know your teacher's right? And now she had to think for a minute. And she said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. <laughs> and then the pastor said, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And now she's exasperated and she said, well, then you can ask him. You know. <laughs> We're in the second week of a series we're calling God in Pursuit. It's the book of Jonah. And like Pastor Sterling said last week, the book of Jonah is in many ways one of the most familiar stories in all the Bible. Most first graders who grew up in Sunday school know the story of Jonah and the whale, right? It's got lots of stuff kids like. It's got a boat, it's got a storm, it's got a big fish. Later, it's got a king and it's got cows. It's even got vomit. Sorry, but that's the word that's used. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as you know now, if you are here last week, the book of Jonah is really not about a whale. It's not even a children's story. It's a brilliantly written ancient story that's really a satirical drama, a somewhat humorous drama about a prideful, self-righteous, disobedient prophet, and it's about the mercy of the God who pursues disobedient people. And the whole book is written this, this way, to hit God's people right between the eyes. Last week we were in chapter one and we saw that God called the prophet Jonah to go to Nineveh. Now Nineveh happened to be one of the great pagan cities of the world, and God had never called one of his prophets to go to a pagan city before, but he calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. It's located in the kingdom of Assyria, which is one of the most uh, brutal and violent people groups in the history of the world, and they're enemies of the nation of Israel. So Jonah doesn't want to go to the Ninevites because he doesn't want them to have even a chance to repent and know God's mercy. That's because the Ninevites were pagan people. They were bad. They did awful things. They were enemies. And this is an example of what we could call tribalistic thinking. Jonah was thinking us versus them. It's one of the great sins of the human race is that we tend to think us versus them. We tend to think tribally. So Jonah buys a one-way ticket to a place called Tarshish, which was as far from God as he could imagine. By the way, if you're running from God or you want to run from God, you can always find a boat willing to take you where you want to go. So Jonah finds that boat. And he soon discovers what we all eventually discover sooner or later is that while we can run from God, we really can't hide from God. So God sends a great storm. The boat's in trouble. The pagan sailors are crying out to their pagan gods. And they beg Jonah to wake up and cry out to his God, the one Jonah says he worships and fears, the God he calls Yahweh, the Lord, the God of land and sea. And that terrifies these pagan sailors. But it doesn't seem to terrify Jonah very much. And I say that because he doesn't 
cry out to his God in repentance. He doesn't pray. He just says, it's all my fault, so just throw me into the sea and the storm will end. So with great reluctance, again in chapter one, we saw that the pagan sailors do just that. They throw Jonah in the sea, the storm stops, and then they respond by offering their prayers and worship, not to their pagan gods, but rather to the Lord Yahweh, the God of Jonah, the God of the Israelites. So everything in this story is upside down and backwards. And in all of this, we see a theme introduced, and it's the theme of the whole book of Jonah. The man of God disagrees with the purpose of God, which is to share his word and his salvation with the whole world, not just with his people, but even with the outsiders, even with the pagan Ninevites. And because Jonah disagrees with God, he becomes disobedient to God and he runs from God. While the pagan sailors turn to God in praise and worship. Now we pick up the story today with the very last verse of chapter one. And we read verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So I want to begin today with God's provision. God's provision. When I was about 25 years old, um, and I've shared this many times in the past, I was single, believed God had called me into a life of ministry. I just didn't know exactly what that meant and how to get there. So I was working my way through a graduate degree in counseling psychology and considering seminary. And I ran into a unique program at a seminary in California, Fuller Theological Seminary, that combined a seminary degree, it's called an MDiv, with a doctorate in, psycholo in clinical psychology called a PsyD. And you did it all at one time, and that sounded just perfect for me. It's where I wanted to go. And because it's where I wanted to go, I assumed it was where God wanted me to go. Uh, and even though I saw in the brochure they were only going to accept nine applicants out of over 400, I had compassion on the others who were not going to get in. <laughs> so I applied, gave up my apartment lease, prepared to head to California. And about two or three weeks later, I got a letter from Fuller, a very thin envelope. And thin envelopes mean rejection. I didn't get in. I was stunned. And then I was disappointed and then I was angry, it made me mad. I felt like God had pulled a Lucy on me, you know, good old Lucy. I felt like he just completely faked me out, pulled the ball out and I fell flat on my back. I had to scramble now. I had nowhere to live for the next year. What was I gonna do? I had to find a place to live, find a job. What was God up to? Why would he do this kind of thing to me? Two months later, since I was staying in the same place, I met a beautiful young woman named Lorene. And two weeks from now, we will have been married 39 years. What I learned is that sometimes God doesn't give us what we want because he has something much better in mind. And we see something like that in this story. Jonah doesn't like God's plan. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh. So he runs in the complete opposite direction. But God chases him down sends a storm to get his attention, but Jonah goes to sleep to avoid paying attention. The storm gets worse. The sailors wake him up and beg him to cry out to his God, who is the God of land and sea, but he doesn't pray. He doesn't repent. In a sense, he would rather die than go to Nineveh. So they throw him into the sea to drown. And this should be the end of the story of Jonah right there. God should go find another prophet, but he doesn't. He doesn't give up on Jonah. This should be the end of Jonah. He should drown in the sea, but it's not the end of Jonah. Verse 17 again. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah doesn't drown. He gets swallowed whole by a giant fish. Now that doesn't sound like the most pleasant of experiences to me. If you're counting, this is now the third miracle nature we see in the story. Miracle one, God hurled a storm at Jonah. Miracle number two, he calmed the sea after they threw him into the ocean, into the sea. Miracle three, God now provides a huge fish. And God does all of this to accomplish his purpose, his purpose in Jonah and his purpose for Nineveh. 
Last week, Sterling reminded us that this is the verse that Jesus quotes when he refers to his own death and resurrection. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man, talking about himself, will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So at the very least, the fact that Jesus compares his own death and resurrection to the story of Jonah means that we should be looking for things in the story of Jonah that point us to the story of Jesus. And one of those things is that Jesus, in Jesus, God is pursuing people that he loves. He's pursuing the people of Israel. He pursues people outside of Israel, Gentiles, which is most of us. He's pursuing you. Instead of that, what we usually pay attention to, what just grabs our attention because inquiring minds want to know is what? The fish, the huge fish. We want to know about the fish, right? What kind of fish was it? Was it a whale? What kind of whale was it? Was it a blue whale, sperm whale, humpback whale? What, what if it was a whale shark? And could a human being really live, survive for three days in the belly of a fish? Now, what we need to see here is that the narrator of the story, the writer of the story, gives us no detail about the fish. You would think there would be a whole chapter stuck in the middle of Jonah just about the fish because it's so interesting. We have so many questions. That that doesn't tell us anything. just says it was a huge fish. And I think that's because the two most important words in the verse are not huge fish. I wonder if you can see what they are. Look at the verse again. I'm giving you some help. (laughs) Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. The Lord provided, the Hebrew word there provided means appointed, assigned, prepared a huge fish. Now, Maybe you're here today and you've always been somewhat skeptical about things in the Bible like this. And over the last few hundred years, skeptics have often pointed to Jonah, the story, as proof that the Bible is just a a religious fairy tale that is full of ancient mythology because of this preposterous story of a man being swallowed by a huge fish. But let me just say this. The whole story of the Bible begins with this sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Two weeks ago, Christians all over the world celebrated the resurrection of Jesus from the dead as the very center of our faith, the hope of our salvation and eternal life. And once you accept that God created the entire universe, once you accept that Jesus is the resurrected Lord, a big fish really isn't a big deal. For example, how many of you watched the solar eclipse a couple weeks ago? Almost all of us watched it. Pretty cool, right? Now, how many of you also watched later that day the news coverage of the eclipse? Well, I did that. And I noticed that nearly half of the national news broadcast was just interviewing people about their experience of viewing the eclipse. And person after person gushed about how thrilling and amazing it was. And it was pretty amazing. They were emotional. Some people wept with joy. Many spoke in sort of spiritual terms, like, I felt connected to the universe, one person said. Another said, it was like heaven came down just for a moment. But in the broadcast I watched, not a single person, at least not a person they put on screen, mentioned God. Not a single person. Not a single person recognized the creator that stands behind the beauty and precision of the creation. Reminded me of what Paul writes in the book of Romans. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. I have to say, it made me sad. In the same way, the story of Jonah is just not about the fish. Don't get stuck on the fish. The story of Jonah is about God 
the God who assigned Jonah to go to Nineveh, the God who hurled the storm at Jonah to get his attention, the God who provided the fish to save Jonah. The fish is there in the story to tell us something about God. The fish is a manifestation of the sovereign authority of the God who created all things and the great mercy of this God. So Jonah is running from the God who cannot be escaped. Jonah would rather die than see the Ninevites repent. He's thrown into the sea and he's going to die in his own disobedience. But in his great mercy, God provides. My guess is that if you're here today and you're a believer, that is you've put your faith in the provision of salvation through Jesus, you have a fish story. Meaning at some point when you were far from God or maybe running from God or maybe in a storm somehow in your life, God sent a fish. Not a literal fish, but maybe a person, maybe a friend, maybe a life situation, maybe a sermon, and he scooped you up. And he saved you. And if you're not yet a believer and you're here and you're curious, you're searching, you're looking, you're trying to decide what all this means, your fish story could start today because it's a faith story. Next, we see that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, what comes to mind with three days and three nights? Well, Jesus. He's already quoted Jonah, this verse. Uh, and now we, and we saw a couple of weeks ago when he cleansed the temple and threw out the money changers that John's gospel tells us, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple, talking about his body, and I will raise it again in three days. So the three days points us to Jesus, but there's more than that. There are Old Testament scholars who suggest that in ancient Hebrew thinking, Three days and three nights was how long it took to get the Sheol, the place of the dead, and back again. So this may have been the ancient writer's way of saying Jonah was a goner, as good as dead. But God provides salvation. God saves Jonah from death with a fish. Jesus saves us from death with a cross. Paul writes, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, running from him, far from him, Christ died for us. Jonah doesn't deserve God's salvation. Jonah deserved to be thrown into the sea. But in his relentless pursuit and boundless mercy, God provides for him. And in Jesus, God has provided for you too. That leads us to the second point, and that is Jonah's prayer. Most of this chapter is Jonah's prayer. Years ago when I was in college, uh, my dad was pastor of a small church in Florida, and there was a man in his church at the time, an older man, older gentleman, who was known for his prayers. They were not only ornate and very theological, they were almost always about his wife, who did not come to church with him. And I have to admit, there were times when I was home, I would go to church just so I could hear this man pray. It would always start off well. He would be, oh, Lord. He, he had a really, like, holy sounding voice. Oh, Lord, I come before you humbly on my knees, Lord, in great humility. And I thank you for your marvelous grace that has saved me and sanctified me. But, oh, Lord, I pray for my wife. You know her, Lord. You know how far she is from you. You know how, how hateful she is to me. <laughs> you know how hard I've tried to get her to come to church. And on and on it would go. And it would get worse and worse from there. And I would think, no wonder she doesn't come to church with him. <laughs> and we're going to see just a hint of this in Jonah's prayer. Chapter 2, verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now I want to pause there. This is the first time in the story so far that Jonah, prophet of God, actually prays. He didn't pray when God called him to go to Nineveh. That would have been a good thing to do. He didn't pray when he decided to go to Tarshish. Would have probably been a better thing to do. 
He didn't pray when the storm came, he went to sleep, but now he prays. Why, I wonder? Well, he's in trouble. God's got his attention. I wonder if you can relate to Jonah. How often does it take trouble to move you to prayer? Is prayer often the last resort? This is sort of a foxhole prayer. The belly of the fish is Jonah's place of attention. Now let's look at his prayer, beginning in verse 2. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. That one's kind of funny. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me, beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and I, my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love from them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. So Jonah prays from the belly of a fish. And this is not only a prayer, this is actually a psalm. It's a beautifully crafted song. Now, we don't know if jo Jonah just knew this song from somewhere and he recites it when he's in the fish or whether he actually... Uh, composed it in his head in that situation. We don't really know. But when we first read through this prayer, this song, we're impressed. It's beautiful. It's full of gratitude for God's provision. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. It's full of praise for the God who saves and delivers from trouble. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. It includes what seems like a change of heart. Like repentance, I said I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I will turn and look again toward you. And it concludes with what sounds like a renewed commitment to obedience. But I, he says, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Now, this is a psalm of salvation. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. It's a prayer of repentance. It's a celebration of the mercy and grace of God who pursues his runaways, who pursues the lost, who saves the undeserving. Jonah prays, I was as good as dead, but you saved me. So in many ways, this is like a model prayer for us. We are to be continually grateful and mindful of the grace of the God who saves us when we don't deserve to be saved. But I wonder if you noticed verse 8 at all. Let me go back to it and read it for you. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Now, if you could go back through the prayer, it's been full of I and you talking to God and me. I and you and me. I was here, you did this to me, for me. But here he suddenly turns to those. Who's he talking about now? Knowing a little bit of the story. I think he's talking about them. You know, them, the pagans, the Ninevites. This is like that man in my dad's church praying about his wife's sins, right? Remember, Jonah ran from God in the first place because he didn't want the Ninevites to even have a chance to repent. He didn't agree with God's purpose. He didn't, he didn't want them to hear God's word, so he ran the opposite way. And yet God, Yahweh, who was his God, he says is not, should not be their God. He belongs to us. His grace belongs to us. We see here, I think again, the us versus them thinking. Now, at this point, and the, the first audience to hear this story, to read it in the ancient world, would have chuckled at this. Jonah is still unaware that the pagan sailors that he told to throw him into the sea, when the sea calmed, 
they turned and offered their praise and worship, not to their pagan gods, but to Jonah's God, to Yahweh, who made the sea and dry land. Jonah doesn't know that because he was in the sea. So this is a prayer of correct theology. Jonah is grateful for God's mercy and grace and salvation, but he still kind of thinks it's only for him, not them. That leads us to the third point we see today, and that is God's purpose. God's purpose. Verse 10, last verse in chapter 2. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. We'll look at two words here. First, the word commanded. The word translated commanded is actually the Hebrew word amar, which means to speak. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. Same word. God's word is his command, and God's speech carries God's authority, and God's command carries out God's purpose. God commanded the fish. The second word is vomited. Now, it's not a pleasant word. In ancient Hebrew, it means exactly what it sounds like, to spew out as when one is violently ill, sick. And throughout the Bible, this word is most often used as a term of disgust. It suggests to us that even though Jonah has finally prayed and seems willing to obey, God is not entirely pleased about something. Dr. John Dixon, who will preach the closing message in this series in a couple of weeks, says it this way, praise for salvation without compassion for the lost is sickening to God. Now that may seem a bit harsh, but we're gonna see in the next couple of weeks, and if you read Jonah on your own, I hope you will, it's only four chapters, 48 verses, the next two chapters will show us why God is unhappy with the deepest attitudes of Jonah's heart. There's also some sort of the tragic humor here. God speaks to Jonah, commands Jonah. Jonah does not obey. God speaks to the fish, commands the fish, and the fish obeys. That's kind of funny. God is pursuing Jonah in the midst of his resistance. God is saving Jonah from himself. Have you ever needed to be saved from yourself? Here's the point. God did not call Jonah to go to Tarshish. God did not pursue Jonah for Tarshish. God did not save Jonah so he could spend the rest of whatever was left of his life walking the beaches of Tarshish with a metal detector. God called Jonah for his purpose. God saved Jonah for his purpose. And the same thing is true for every single one of us. Uh, many of you know my brother Joe is a pastor in Ohio, and he tells a story about a man who came to see him in his office years ago. He said the guy walked into his office, the guy my brother did not recognize right away. He walks in, before he even introduces himself, he walks in and he points at my brother and goes, you're starting to tick me off. Only he used a little more colorful expression. My brother said, excuse me? He said, yeah. My wife dragged me in here a couple months ago and I didn't want to come. And now I'm starting to pay attention. And it ticks me off, he said. Started a productive conversation in that man's life. But I wonder if in some way you or maybe we are starting to pay attention to this story. Meaning maybe in some way you've been running from God. I mean, you're here physically, but somewhere internally, Spiritually, personally, you've, you've, been, you've been running, kind of avoiding. There's something he wants you to do. There's something he wants you to stop. And he's after you. He's pursuing you. Like the song said, he's the ever-chasing God. Or maybe you find yourself in a storm today. Maybe you're in the belly of a huge fish, and you're starting to pay attention. You're starting to pray like you never prayed before. Good. Good. Good, you're on your way to faith in the God who pursues you in Jesus. Or maybe you see something of yourself in Jonah. That is, you've, you've been grateful for 
the mercy and grace you've received. You're truly grateful for that. But you have a tendency to think of, you know, that person in your life, that relative, that neighbor, that group of people as being them. That doesn't really qualify for God's grace. And he's pursuing you about that. Maybe even calling you to go to Nineveh. Will you bow with me as we close? Lord, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for this ancient and strange story of a runaway prophet. And Lord, help us to see not just Jonah, this character, but ourselves. So we thank you that you will not let us hide no matter how far we run and that you pursue us. We thank you that you provide salvation to us even when we don't deserve it and remind us that what you provide for us, you also want to provide for them. May we be messengers of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Right at the end of Jonah's prayer, he said, salvation comes from the Lord. And that's true. And if this morning you've sensed the Lord pursuing you, and today you want to just turn to him for salvation and say, you are my salvation. I hope you'll do that. I'll be down here in front. If you want to come talk about it, I'll pray with you. And you can make sure of your salvation today. Receive now today's benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who saves us, calls us, and pursues us for his great purpose in the world. Amen. Have a great day. Thank you.